why don't we get started? Can everyone hear me? No? It's, um, so are all of your mics turned on? We can hear me now? Wonderful. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are now having a, a change in gears. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. Senator Feingold is able to deal with the great difficulties of, uh, of DRC, but Washington traffic is, has proved daunting this morning. So we're delighted that all of you are here. This is panel is on peace building and diplomacy, challenges and opportunities in Africa. And the challenges of peace building in Africa seem overwhelming with heartbreaking conflict going on now in South Sudan, CAR, Nigeria, and precarious situations across the Sahel, the Great Lakes, and the Horn. But today we are tremendously fortunate to have with us three of the country's most experienced diplomats and policy experts to talk about their own experiences in peace building and diplomacy in Africa. You have full bios in your packet, but just to highlight, Former Senator Russell Feingold in the middle is a special advisor for the Great Lakes and Democratic Republic of the Congo for the US State Department. He represented the state of Wisconsin for 18 years and during this time served on and led the US Senate Africa Subcommittee traveling frequently to the continent. And I should tell you we have a re robust delegation from Wisconsin here today, so I'm sure you'll hear from him. <laughs> Immediately on my left, Ambassador Princeton Lyman is a senior advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace and served most recently as special envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, and over the course of a long and distinguished foreign policy career, served as the ambassador to Nigeria and South Africa. And Ambassador Johnny Carson on my far left, former Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs, served as ambassador to Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Uganda over a 37-year foreign service career. So welcome to all of you. And we wanted to structure this as an informal panel to really have some back and forth on the difficult issues, and then, of course, to open the floor for your questions. I'm, unfortunately, we could have three conferences dedicated to these questions. We only have 45 minutes today, but at least we can scratch the surface. So I would love to ask each of you, starting on my left with Ambassador Lyman and moving down the line, a question about what are some of the underlying forces driving the conflicts that we're seeing in Africa right now? Well, let me speak uh, quickly to the Sudan situation. You had two conflicts, really, that we've had to address over recent years. One is the separation of South Sudan from Sudan, a long, complicated peace process, and achieving that without a return to war. That, uh, that agreement was a result of two civil wars, the last one lasting for 20 years before it was resolved. But the issues between the countries, even after South Sudan became <coughs> excuse me, independent, were threatening and involved a great deal of diplomacy, which we can get into later. Then we have, after two years after South Sudan's independence, a complete breakdown uh, in that country and, and civil war. And there's a lot to think about as to what was missed and what was lacking in South Sudan. Uh, that it wasn't able to manage its independence. And it's really, in my view, a failure of the political structure uh, of the country. It's, it was able to fight its way to independence. It was able to set up a government, but it was not politically equipped to deal with political tensions and rivalries. So fa failure of political structures. Thank you. Senator. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing to say, I think, is that there is no common theme for all the conflicts in, in, in the, on the continent. Uh, there are some common themes that exist, and I think one would be the consequences of the uh, colonial decision-making about the boundaries of countries. When you look at a place like Nigeria, if you've ever worked on that, as I know these gentlemen have, the, the idea of putting together a country with that kind of composition is almost uh, begging for some of the problems that exist at this point. But each situation is separate, and, and the one with the Great Lakes is, uh, that I'm involved with is, is really a uh, sort of unique. Uh, of course, there have been difficulties with regard to these countries uh, in, for many years. But the intertwining of the countries in this conflict in eastern Congo is a relatively recent development that relates in part to the Rwandan genocide of 1994 
and the consequences of the uh, those who are now known as the FDLR, but their predecessors, the Genocidaires, coming over into that region. And then others uh, seeing an ungoverned region as a window of opportunity. The ADF using it as a base to threaten Uganda. And then the reverse, where uh, the M23, uh, with a clear relationship with the country of Rwanda, having a relationship across the borders. So this enormous human tragedy is coupled with these uh, in international boundaries and op uh, windows of opportunity of, a, of an essentially ungovernable region or ungoverned region that needs to be changed. But that's, that's not a pattern everywhere, but is one example. Certainly where you are. Thank you. I agree with uh, Senator Feingold that uh, the reasons behind uh, conflicts uh, in Africa uh, have both uh, similarities and dissimilarities. But let me say uh, something about a country uh, that is in conflict today, uh, and that is uh, Nigeria uh, and what drives the uh, insecurity uh, in two parts of that country. Uh, in the northern uh, part of the country where uh, Boko Haram has uh, been uh, particularly brutal and responsible for uh, the kidnapping of some 276 Nigerian schoolgirls, and a second uh, conflict in that country uh, in the middle belt uh, of the uh, nation. Uh, in the north, uh, the problems uh, and the drivers uh, are uh, a result of sustained uh, economic uh, decline and underdevelopment. Uh, northern uh, Nigeria uh, is the poorest uh, part uh, of the country, and in the northeast, uh, where the greatest amount of violence uh, is occurring, uh, is uh, absolutely uh, the most impoverished uh, part uh, of that uh, nation. Uh, so we have seen uh, economic uh, uh, decline uh, and large-scale uh, immiseration. Uh, equally, we see political marginalization, uh, people in the North uh, feeling as though their issues are not properly uh, catered to, cared for uh, in uh, Abuja. And we see uh, a uh, flawed uh, security uh, policy, uh, which uh, has been uh, heavy uh, on uh, the retaliation side uh, and not nearly as sharp and sophisticated as it should be in terms of investigation, uh, capture uh, a, uh, of uh, terrorists uh, through uh, intelligence uh, and surgical uh, operations. Uh, we also have not seen uh, the kind of uh, policies uh, which are designed to win over uh, the hearts and minds of people uh, in the North. Uh, a need for a social and economic strategy uh, deals with the poverty to go along with a much refined security strategy. But if you look at uh, the second crisis in Nigeria uh, in the Middle Belt, uh, that uh, is a crisis which some people label uh, as religious. Uh, uh, between uh, herders, uh, House of Fulani from the north, and settled uh, populations uh, that have traditionally been uh, farmers. That's largely a resource conflict, uh, a conflict uh, driven by uh, uh, environmental changes, by climate changes. Uh, as we see uh, herders uh, increasingly uh, desperate in the need of, of more grazing land for their cattle, more water, uh, they have pushed south uh, into farmlands that have been traditionally farmed uh, by the people in the Middle Belt. So that is a resource crisis uh, and one uh, which has its roots uh, in environmental change. Good. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask you about a question that's relevant for all of the regions in which you work and where we as, a, as peace builders feel really strongly about engagement, and that's around elections. And what is your analysis of the dangers in upcoming elections in your regions? Uh, what do you feel that civil society can do to help prime the ground for a more peaceful election process? And what is your role as envoys in assuring that these are not just elections in name only and that they really do further a political, a, a legitimate political process? 
Well, to be very candid in the Sudan peace process uh, that was laid out in 2005, there were to be elections in the north and the south uh, before the separation of the two countries. It was supposed to democratize both entities. It did the opposite. It solidified one power rule in party rule at each side. And the peacemakers, all of us said, we'll let that go because the bigger thing is to get an agreement on, on the independence of South Sudan. Now, in both Sudan and South Sudan, you're, you see scheduled elections for 2015. I think neither country, frankly, ought to go forward with those elections. In Sudan, they really need a much bigger political transformation so that those elections will be more meaningful. South Sudan, I think there has to be a much bigger reconciliation process and political change. Otherwise, the elections there will be meaningless. So elections are very important. But the question is, do they represent a political moving forward, or do they solidify power relationships that are not sustainable? And are you saying that no election is better than election which is um, would not be legitimate or timely? Deferred election. Deferred election. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. <laughs> Let me uh, distinguish between the general issue of elections and what a, a special envoy does because uh, he or she has to sort of talk to a number of countries at once. And then the, the particular importance of the upcoming elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo in and of themselves. You know, as a general message, both the United States and the international community, of course, wants to encourage countries to have free, fair, and transparent elections. We want them to respect their constitutions. We don't want them, and we think it's in their best interests and all of our best interests if they don't change the constitution in terms of term limits for their presidents for an individual. They do it in a forward-looking way after the next office holder, as the United States did when it created term limits for its president. Well, that's a different story, but, but too often it's the reverse. And as a general rule, it's been our observation that those countries that have allowed a, a clean trans, uh, transition from one executive to another have done better. So that's a challenge, because if you start focusing in on one particular country and saying, you really need to do this, they will say, as the DRC is saying to us at the moment, you, know, you need to give this same message to all the other countries, and we're trying to be as consistent as possible. But sometimes a particular election in a particular place is so important in an overriding way for the future of a particular country that it goes beyond the exact principles I just stated. Such is the case with regard to the DRC. Uh, when I was in the Senate in 2006, uh, these gentlemen truly are experienced diplomats. I am a 10-month diplomat. <laughs> but I remember being uh, in the Senate. Uh, uh, I remember being in the Senate, and we were very surprised in a positive way by the elections in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They were far better than we might have expected, given the fact that President Kabila only became president because his father was killed, and he was chosen to become president. That was the good news aspect of the election. Unfortunately, in 2011, uh, essentially the, re the reverse occurred. Elections that were not credible. Elections that the international community, the Carter Center and others could not say were good elections. So uh, uh, my staff warns me on these trips not to use American cliches, but privately I say, this one coming up in 2016 is the rubber match. <laughs> this is the one that, that will determine uh, whether this country is really going to go forward respecting the Constitution, having a legitimate elections, whether local or provincial. And what it has to do with is not just a, sort of a general democratic value. The very credibility of this country as an economic unit, as a political unit, and in particular, its ability to govern the eastern part of that country that has take, suffered so much will depend on the people of that country believing that they really are represented by their government. So, not to say that the other elections aren't terribly important. They are. We're going to Burundi next week because we're concerned about the elections coming up there. But this DRC election in 2016 and those that may precede it are fundamental to the future of that country. Thank you. Elections are an essential part of the democratic process, uh, whether it is in the United States, uh, Canada, uh, India, or Botswana or Ghana. Uh, we also uh, know uh, that uh, elections uh, generate uh, tensions. Uh, and far too often uh, in uh, Africa, uh, politicians uh, use uh, elections uh, 
uh, and uh, to generate uh, support in ways that inflame the tensions uh, by uh, appealing to ethnic uh, loyalties, religious uh, loyalties, uh, to territorial loyalties, to old uh, grievances. Uh, these tensions uh, raise the stakes uh, of elections uh, across uh, the continent. Uh, I think in looking at uh, African uh, elections, uh, we uh, all need to be uh, as proactive as we possibly can be in working with civil society, uh, with uh, media, with community groups, uh, with youth and women to uh, put in place uh, mechanisms that will reduce uh, the prospects for violence and tension uh, in elections. One great example of what has been achieved uh, is to look at Kenya. Uh, following the December 2007 elections there, there was widespread violence across that country uh, in January uh, and February. Uh, some uh, 1,500 people uh, were killed, uh, and it required the intervention of Kofi Annan uh, and a number of other leading African statesmen and women to come in to quell that uh, violence. Indeed, uh, following that uh, violence, people realized that 70 percent of the violence uh, that it had occurred occurred uh, as a result of young men uh, being uh, involved. Uh, to its credit, USAID, working with a number of private sector partners, and, uh, including World Vision and Mercy Corps and Winrock, uh, set up a program called uh, 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 Youth, uh, uh, Yes, Youth Can. Yes, youth can. And it helped to mobilize, this was in 2009, helped to mobilize hundreds of thousands of young Kenyans to uh, effectively to discourage them from participating uh, in uh, violence, uh, encouraging them to be more civically responsible and active helping them to create jobs, hope, and opportunity uh, for uh, their uh, communities. And as the election cycle uh, approached, the last election cycle approached, these young Kenyans uh, were out uh, preaching uh, a message of peace and tolerance. Uh, today, uh, this uh, Yes, Youth Can movement across uh, Kenya uh, has uh, over one million young Kenyans uh, in, uh, across the country. And in the run-up to the elections, they held peace rallies, they had soccer games between different ethnic communities, constituency meetings in which they made uh, the candidates all swear to peace pledges, uh, and uh, worked with uh, communities uh, to ensure that the level uh, of violence would not repeat itself uh, in, uh, uh, in the, the, the elections that uh, occurred in, uh, in early 2013. But I, the important thing is to be uh, proactive uh, in all of these elections, uh, whether they are elections that are forthcoming, and I think Senator Feingold was absolutely right in his strong message on the Congo, whether it is in the Congo, whether uh, it is in the elections that took place just two days ago in Malawi, uh, whether it's in the uh, forthcoming uh, elections that we see around the continent, it's important to serve as partners uh, uh, to those uh, communities uh, in Africa participating in elections to put in place programs that will reduce the level of tension that always comes uh, with elections. Uh, these are electoral uh, contests. Uh, they should never be the uh, basis or grounds for uh, the violence that we've seen in some of these uh, places. Good, thank you. And this raises something of an existential question, especially with Kenya. 
where the issue of prosecution by the International Criminal Court was a factor both in the eventual slate that ran for the presidency and also in the prospects of peace there. And I wonder if all of you could speak just a little bit to the tension, if you feel it, between justice and accountability and, and reaching peace agreements, and if that's something that you wrestle with in a very concrete way. Well, it comes up in both Sudan and South Sudan now. It comes up in Sudan that the president of Sudan is an indicted war criminal. Uh, and it's, it's, it has to do with how you uh, interact with Sudan on, on the peace process, but it's also a, a challenge to those inside of Sudan who want to change the political system and undertake a serious political transformation, but frankly say to us, what do we do with the president? Because we are not politically able to turn him over and we don't know how to move uh, beyond him. In South Sudan, where we've seen some very recent, very serious, uh, terrible human rights violations and ethnic killing, et cetera, there's a demand for accountability. But if you look at the South Sudan situation and you watch what people are saying, you realize that South Sudan has a long history in which accountability has never been addressed. So people are saying, I remember what they did to us in the 90s. Somebody else said, well, I remember what they did to us in the 70s. Before one sets up tribunals and starts to try people in South Sudan, I feel the country needs to have a real conversation about justice, accountability, and reconciliation, and come to an agreement as to how do they want to deal with this, through a truth and reconciliation, through some tribunals, through political uh, questions. But you can't just go and impose something on it without recognizing that this is an issue this country must deal with in a very fundamental way itself, and then decide how it can balance justice, accountability, and reconciliation so they can move on. And I think it's a difficult process, and I hear voices on the South Sudan. Ban Ki-moon says we're going to set, we should set up an international tribunal, and others say refer them to The Hague. And yeah, there are some people you can single out that way, and the government has done that. But I think it's a mistake not to deal with this more fundamentally. In the, in the South Sudan case. Ideally, you would be able to do that in Sudan. Things could be harder in Sudan. And are you saying to do that at all levels of society? Yes, that, it that has to be, because, because ethnic groups have been at war with each other in South Sudan and in Sudan, and they have to have a voice, whether it's through civil society, the churches, or otherwise. can't just be through the political people who've been manipulating those uh, uh, violent confrontations. Thank you. Of the many dilemmas we face in the Great Lakes region, this was the one of the very first that we confronted very directly. Uh, our first task as a group of international envoys uh, was decided was to go and to try to cause the Kampala talks, which had to do with getting the M23 to stop their rebellion against the DRC, to succeed. But there had been negotiations with the M23 and their, or actually their predecessors on other occasions where the DRC agreed uh, to the peace side of the equation as opposed to the accountability side of the equation where uh, leaders of the predecessor groups were given amnesty, and not only amnesty, but the ability to return to the Congolese military in charge of their own units and keeping their units intact. This had happened twice before. So fortunately, there was a unity of, of interest on the part of both the DRC their uh, negotiators, as well as the public, felt strongly that this kind of uh, impunity should not continue, and the international community felt uh, that this was a red line. So this became the basis of some very heavy-duty negotiations. There were two particularly long sessions uh, in Kampala where the issue of amnesty was uh, among the most central issues. So it was finally resolved that there would not be amnesty for those who had committed war crimes or crimes against humanity. Individuals who had simply waged rebellion would be given the opportunity and are given the opportunity under the agreement to sign a pledge that they will renounce rebellion and not do that anymore, and if they haven't committed other crimes, they can get uh, immunity from prosecution, but not those who have committed war crimes. So this was one of the most important aspects of what became the Nairobi declarations where we had to balance this, but of course there's always the irony, which is that this was signed in the State House 
of the president and the vice president who are under charges of the ICC <laughs> and in our presence. So it's always a little complicated. Thank you. It would be uh, ideal uh, and almost uh, utopian to have both justice, peace, uh, and stability going uh, uh, along together. But in fact, the reality uh, is that in different places, uh, justice is frequently set aside in order to get both peace uh, and stability. Uh, this is, I think, the case of, 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 of Kenya, uh, where indeed you have a president and a vice president uh, who uh, were both uh, ICC and ITs for their alleged uh, activities in fomenting and supporting the violence in Kenya uh, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, there uh, has really been uh, very little uh, domestic uh, justice uh, for the victims uh, of the violence. Uh, and the international uh, process uh, has uh, been very, very slow and uh, delayed. Uh, but uh, while there has not, in fact, uh, been uh, justice and accountability, uh, there has been a higher level uh, of peace and stability. Uh, the uh, 2013 elections uh, were not violence-free, but they were substantially and significantly less, less violent uh, than the elections in 07 uh, and, uh, uh, and 08. Uh, the trade-off uh, is seen in different places uh, around uh, Africa uh, as well. Uh, we've seen uh, flawed uh, processes in places like Zimbabwe, uh, where uh, untold pre-election violence has been meted out against the opposition, uh, and uh, justice uh, has uh, not uh, been uh, delivered there, uh, only uh, a slow form of, of peace. So it differs from, from place to place. Uh, we'd like to have both. It's important to have accountability for those who commit uh, crimes or are alleged to have commit crimes, uh, but sometimes uh, the justice part of it uh, is, in fact, delayed. I just add one thing on this. I think one of the important things is you, you don't ignore the history. Yeah. If there was one value to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, it was what people were able to get the history out. De Klerk wanted to just amnesty everybody and forget the past. That would have let it, left it simmering. Mm -hmm. The Truth and Reconciliation <clears throat> brought it all out. People had to face what had happened and then decide how to deal with it. That, it seems to me, is important, that people understand the history and acknowledge it uh, and the, the, the things on both sides and then figure out, okay, now how do we move forward? And even since the South Africa uh, case, there have been a number of hybrid kinds of processes yep. where you can face the history without necessarily going to the International Criminal Court, right. that there are shades right. of gray. Yeah. One of the issues with Burundi is that they are still expected to do a Truth and Reconciliation Commission years after the, the uh, agreements that, that, that led to a relatively peaceful period, and that is, has not happened yet, and I, I think it's uh, essential that it does. So let me ask you a final question before we throw it open for our Q&A. And um, earlier this year, when Mali was, was coming into the final stages of its crisis before the elections, and the United States was having its own near, or the government shut down, uh, an ambassador from the Sahel said very poignantly, you know, we look at what's happening in Washington, and we look at the Chinese model, and we say, you know, it might be a lot easier to go the Chinese model route. Um, could I ask all of you in your experience as American envoys and ambassadors, to what extent do you feel that you're bringing with you a certain set of American values around governance, around democracy, and to what extent are, are you feeling that there is receptivity to that or is there pushback? Look, I, uh, uh, I think uh, each situation is a little bit different in terms of what our influence is on the particular crisis when we go into that. You're not, I don't like the idea that peacemakers are neutral. 
you're not neutral in terms of the settlement you want because you don't want a settlement that's a false settlement. That just says, oh, well, it looks like it's settled. I used to call that in, into, into the end, I used to call that the whale, war after I leave. You just get it done <laughs> enough to so make it out. You're also not morally <laughs> neutral. In South Africa, ending apartheid had to be part of the solution. You, 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 in Afghanistan, you don't want a solution that meant all those girls that have now got education are suddenly going to lose it all. So you're not totally neutral. We bring values. We bring certain values to the, to the situation, certain belief in processes, et cetera. Yeah, are we perfect on it? No. But those values, if they're relevant to the society, and usually they are, and if you're honest and, and can build credibility about what you're about and that you're respecting the parties you're dealing with, I think you can deal with that question of, of whether America is the right uh, participant, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the leader in this process. Thank you. Well, and from a practical point of view, I feel that uh, a lot of the countries in, in the areas of Africa that I've worked in do really value being positively associated with the United States and its values. And I think that uh, even though, of course, they will say to you, fairly enough, that they're sovereign countries and we can't dictate every aspect of their system, there's a general desire to, to aspire to these values that are also reflected, of course, in terms of international norms of how elections should be conducted and the like. So there is a power in that. And you know, I think, frankly, the Chinese are now going through a challenging period. They've had an enormously uh, in, uh, strong involvement in China, but now they're becoming an issue in, in elections in Zambia. Their role, their political parties are sometimes using this against a, a candidate or a government. So they are even struggling with, with the aspect where some of these values don't come associated uh, with the approach they've taken. Of course, for many African countries, uh, the Chinese approach is a lot easier, at least for the leaders, a lot, not, a lot is not asked. But I think, as I've indicated, uh, I think to be involved in the long term, being consistent with these sorts of values, things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, mm -hmm. the fact that our country uh, took the lead in having a law against bribery, uh, passed by a Wisconsin senator from the past, I might add. Um, not this one, but somebody else. Um, and, and that even though sometimes it disadvantages us, when, when you see the, the, the centrality of corruption as a problem in Africa, the fact that there is a country that's able to function and be successful with this kind of law does have some impact, I think. Thank you. Our diplomacy uh, is strongest uh, and at its best uh, when it represents the best of what our principles and values at home are. Uh, this is in Africa, uh, and as we deal uh, with uh, the concerns that many raise uh, about uh, China, uh, I think that we are strongest when we uh, continue to point out uh, the uh, strength of our Constitution, uh, our Bill of Rights, uh, our freedoms of speech uh, and uh, religion, uh, and of course, uh, our accountability uh, through the strength of our courts. Uh, that set of democratic values uh, underpins and should underpin uh, the basis on which uh, we do a lot of uh, what we do and the success by which we've done it. Uh, I think that uh, uh, our economic system uh, is a lot stronger uh, and a lot better uh, than that uh, of the Chinese. Uh, we have transparency, uh, we have uh, accountability, uh, we uh, generally uh, follow uh, local labor laws, uh, local environmental uh, uh, standards, uh, we uh, transfer technology, uh, and we incorporate uh, Africans into the process. Uh, the Chinese system uh, in uh, Africa uh, does not come uh, with uh, transparency. Uh, it does not uh, come uh, with a respect for uh, labor laws, 
uh, environmental standards, nor does it come with a great deal of technological transfer or technological inclusion. Uh, it's fast, it's expeditious, uh, but it is not bureaucratically transparent. Uh, I think that uh, if, in fact, one is trying to uh, build a strong society, uh, you build it on the basis of openness and a commitment to values and principles. Uh, the democratic values and principles that protect civil liberties also protect intellectual property rights. Uh, they protect citizens and they protect companies through transparent courts of law. Uh, China does offer uh, a different uh, model, uh, but that model uh, in uh, Beijing uh, on the political side uh, does not uh, support transparency. Uh, and it is in many ways uh, a very corrupt uh, and corrupting model. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for questions. Yes, Nashla. And if you can please wait for the mic, I'm very sorry, but the people who are on uh, video can't hear unless we have the mic. Thank you very much for an interesting panel. I'm Nejla Shergi, and I teach at the University of San Diego. Uh, I teach courses on peace building and post-conflict peace building. And we all know that prevention is more effective than post-conflict peace building. And for the last three years in my courses, I've been using South Sudan as a case study. And we knew all of the risk factors in South Sudan, what could go wrong. And we saw it coming every year that there was violence building up. And my question is, what could have been done differently from July 2011 to December 2013 to avoid the bloodshed in South Sudan? And whose responsibility is it to do that? And I'm building on Ambassador Carson's uh, wonderful example of how much we invested in Kenya after the 2007 elections, why were we not, as an international community, able to support South Sudan to avoid the bloodshed? And why don't we cluster a couple of questions and then answer as a panel down here in the green? Thank you. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm here today in my private capacity, um, and I have a question for Ambassador Carson. Um, you talk about uh, U.S. fundamental values, and so, for example, the, the freedom of, of expression of speech. And I look back at Rwanda, and uh, part of what was happening there was the, um, the radio incitement of, of hatred. And if my memory serves me, I believe that General Dallaire reached back to the UN and said, look, we need to take these radio stations out. But uh, that never happened because of the concern about uh, freedom of speech. And I'd like to for you to go ahead and address that. And certainly, um, that is uh, part of uh, um, some of the, the um, what's going on there right now. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more. Yes. Hi, uh, Rob. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Rob Rustigliano, I'm on the board of the Alliance and also from the Partnership for Sustainability and Peacebuilding, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. So I want to focus my question on the once and future senator from Wisconsin. Um, uh, I take that as a yes. Um, and, and, and so one of the critiques, and, and it maybe goes to somewhat of uh, Nigel's question, uh, of the international community's engagement around Africa is it really tends to be focused on dramatic events like elections or crises like the kidnapping in Nigeria or M23 taking Goma a few years ago. And, and so I wanted you to reflect a little bit on your experience as a special envoy. Is that what potential are you seeing, are you, are you able to have to change that so that the engagement is more holistic, that it actually draws in a lot of the diversity of the people that are in this room, and is more sustained at a sufficient in level of intensity to really engage these longer-term patterns and problems that, that you're dealing with all the time? 
So why don't we stop there? And it sounds like each of you had a question directed to your particular area. So why don't we start with Sudan? Well, that Sudan? the question is the one I lose a lot of sleep over, uh, <laughs> thinking about could, why didn't we, could we have seen and prevented what happened in South Sudan. First of all, there was an enormous investment in South Sudan. Uh, in, set, in helping them set up government structures, creating an election, setting up an administration, uh, setting up a government. Much of our attention from 2011, 2013, was on helping them resolve the conflict with Sudan, which continued after independence and threatened war along the border and diverted their attention from their domestic requirements. We saw the political crisis coming. They would, we were discussing it with them. We knew Riek Machar was making that bid for the presidency well in advance. And we said, this is an issue the political party needs to address. But our efforts to help them strengthen the political party were rebuffed, even though they said we had a team out there from the International Republican Institute they never used. And basically, you had a government that was more a liberation army than a political. And when the crisis came, President Kiir dismissed the party and tried to deal with it militarily. I think there perhaps more we should have done and could have done. I was very critical of South Sudan on a number of occasions, particularly their, the leadership's preoccupation with the issues to, with the North relative to the needs of their own people. And that came up over and over again. But I also think we failed in another respect, and it had to do with a lot of differences and problems within our government as well. We didn't have a strong military-to-military -military relationship that allowed us to see that that army was ready to fracture. Because if the army hadn't fractured, you wouldn't have what you have today. And we should have seen that coming. Uh, so there are a lot of things we could have done and, 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 and look back on it, and I think and this is a general long-term proposition, we spend a lot of time thinking about civil society. We don't think enough about how you build political democratic movements. Not civil society goes out in the streets or talks or writes papers, but wins elections and are committed to democracy. And that the SPLM wasn't. Good, thank you. A challenge to us. Senator. Not surprisingly, a terrific question from UW-Milwaukee. But um, <laughs> it happens to be what I was thinking about on the way over here. When I was talking to my staff, cross, crossing the street, looking both ways. I was holding forth on the fact that when we came into this job, it was a very serious crisis in the DRC. It continues to be. But uh, the thing that was on people's minds in Africa was the M23 conflict. So just as we get that put in a good place, uh, we're coming back from Africa and in France, we look on television, it's a car conflict, South Sudan, now there's Nigeria. It is an enormous challenge for the State Department and any administration to maintain any kind of uh, sustained attention on a place that maybe is getting a little better but st still needs a lot of work. And this is, I'll do an advertisement for the people I work for. The Secretary of State and the President had a golden opportunity uh, after the defeat of the M23 to say, look what we did, we're done now. That's not the instruction I got. The instruction was create a process, and it turned out that Angola's helped us do this, to get at the root causes of the problem. Maintain, uh, sort of my motto on this job is sustained attention. Now, the Congress is not as structured, in fairness, to do that sort of thing, even if it's operating well. That's not the nature of the place. That has to come uh, now having served in both environments. That has to come from a sustained commitment by an administration to be more engaged in a place like Africa and in particular the Great Lakes. That's what this administration has decided to do. And if they keep doing it, my hope is that people will begin to see the value of the United States developing a good reputation for promoting peace and the values that the ambassador spoke of in a way that makes us look very responsible and fair in the world. So this is the tough challenge, and, 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 and you're not going to, people aren't going to run for office getting a lot of votes based on what they've done in Burundi. But it creates an impression of, of being a mature, responsible country that wants to lead in a fair way. Thank you. Rwanda. Uh, I don't uh, want to uh, revisit the history of Rwanda uh, in any, any great detail. 
there are lots of lessons to be learned uh, from that. Uh, but uh, the genocide that occurred in Rwanda uh, in 1994 was horrific. Uh, and uh, what occurred uh, uh, was a set of international policy failures. Uh, I think that uh, many people who were involved and associated here uh, recognized uh, that we probably could have and should have uh, acted sooner. I think there are individuals across Europe who also believe that. And I think there are people uh, in New York uh, who uh, are a part of the UN institution past uh, uh, and, and current uh, who recognize that. Uh, clearly, uh, Radio Mill Colleen uh, was spewing uh, enormous amounts of hatred, flaming uh, the uh, uh, ethnic tensions uh, that had existed there uh, for a long time. Uh, it's also very true uh, that uh, uh, General Romeo Dallaire's uh, appeals uh, back to uh, New York uh, were in fact uh, not uh, heeded, uh, and uh, he did not get the kind of uh, resources uh, and support that uh, he genuinely deserved. Coming out of uh, Rwanda, uh, I think uh, we uh, in uh, Washington uh, uh, have learned uh, a lesson I think uh, we continue to uh, learn important lessons uh, about uh, how to prevent uh, genocide. Uh, I will give uh, compliments to uh, President Obama and uh, folks uh, at the NSC and the White House uh, for creating a uh, atrocities prevention uh, review board. Uh, a mechanism uh, that is used worldwide uh, to uh, signal uh, the uh, possibilities of, of uh, atrocities and interagency meetings here in Washington on a regular basis in that atrocities prevention review board to look at places where uh, atrocities could in fact happen. Uh, Rwanda sensitized us, made us much more aware and I think as a result, I think we have tried uh, to respond uh, more rapidly uh, and quickly. Uh, a vignette, I heard the, again the senator uh, say sustainability uh, and attention, uh, having dealt with a, a number of uh, ongoing crises and, and working alongside both of these gentlemen and uh, Ambassador Lyman too uh, on uh, Sudan uh, related issues. Uh, we uh, uh, suffer from uh, a number of deficits. Uh, one is a uh, resource uh, deficit, uh, and uh, one uh, is that sustainable uh, attention uh, deficit. And the resources come both in uh, manpower and woman power uh, to uh, have eyes on uh, the issue and sustain it. The other comes with money. Uh, and the need uh, to uh, have the resources. And the attention means being able not to drift from one crisis uh, to another. And we can, uh, from time to time, have resources, serious resource problems, uh, and we can have uh, crisis overload, uh, which is something uh, that uh, is important. Uh, in my last ambassadorial post uh, was in Kenya. Uh, and uh, in uh, 2003, uh, I think we and uh, the embassy, as well as parts of the Western international community, felt very, very pleased that we had witnessed a successful and peaceful uh, transition of government, where one of Africa's longest standing leaders, Daniel Arap Moy, one of the big men in Africa, had stepped down and an election had occurred between the outgoing, recently outgoing President Mwai Kabaki and the current President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, who was running against him, who's now president. 
Those elections were largely free and fair. People thought Kabaki uh, had won fairly and that Moy had played his part and stepped away after 32 years in office. Things went very smoothly. I remember getting a number of telephone calls and accolades saying how wonderfully we had done in helping the Kenyans move the democratic process forward. But one of the calls that I got was from someone who said, you've done a great uh, job uh, out there. Uh, you're to be uh, congratulated. But the primary reason for my call today is to say we've got to cut back on our development assistance funds to your country. And just at a time when we should be reinvesting as we did after 07 and 08, with greater engagement and greater support, we cut back. We cut back. And it is that sustained attention. Uh, an election is essential uh, to democracy, but it is only uh, a process in the selection of those democratic leaders. After we've seen that democracy work, we need to double down in helping to further strengthen the institutions, further strengthen civil society, and engage as aggressively as we can to build on what has been achieved and not to uh, applaud ourselves for a success and then turn off the attention span and the resource spigot. Thank you. On that note, I want to thank all of you for sharing your wisdom with us and being here today. And I know that, that many people will want to follow up with you, but thank you. Thank you.